An Introduction to the Normal Distribution Many continuous variables which occur naturally, for example your height, your weight and your IQ can be modelled by a normal distribution which has a graph that looks like this. This has a very distinctive looking graph and uh, there are certain properties of this graph that you need to remember. Number one, the graph is bell shaped. Number two, the distribution is perfectly symmetrical about the mean. The population mean goes in the center. Number three, the total area under the curve is equal to one. The area must be equal to 1 for the graph to represent probability. The mean, median and mode all coincide at the centre. The horizontal axis represents your data. For example, you can put your height there, your weight, IQ, that kind of thing. The data is more likely close to the mean and your data is unlikely to take values the further you go away from the mean. You can summarize a normal distribution like this. And you've come across something like this already for the uh, binomial distribution. X is the continuous random variable, which follows a normal distribution. And there's two parameters here that define the normal distribution, the population mean and variance. Take this example here. H, the height of students is a continuous random variable and h is modeled by a normal distribution with a mean of 160 a variance of 100 which gives you a standard deviation of 10 if you square root a variance, you get the standard deviation. This is a sketch of the normal distribution that we were just looking at. The mean is 160, that goes right in the center. The normal distribution extends three standard deviations in each direction from the mean. The standard deviation here is 10. So starting with the mean of 160, add 10, that's one standard deviation. Add two standard deviations. Add three standard deviations from the mean. In the other direction, you subtract standard deviation, so subtract one standard deviation from the mean, subtract two standard deviations from the mean, subtract three standard deviations from the mean. So there you go, you now have a scale that you can work with. So the population mean in the center, and these two values represent the population mean plus one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation. And then you can do that for the other values as well. You've got the population mean plus two standard deviations 
on the right hand side and on the left hand side the population mean minus two standard deviations and then you've got the population mean plus three standard deviations and the population mean minus three standard deviations so put the mean in the center and you need three standard deviations to the right and three standard deviations to the left sixty eight percent of the distribution lies between the mean plus and minus one standard deviation so sixty eight percent of the total area under that curve is now shaded which represents a probability of sixty eight percent or zero point six eight ninety five percent of the distribution lies within two standard deviations of the mean So as you can see, most of the area is concentrated close to the center, so close to the population mean. If you go three standard deviations in each direction of the mean, you're now looking at 99.7% of the total area, so 99.7% of the total distribution. <coughs> that still leaves 0.3% that's unaccounted for. That 0.3% is inside these extreme tails. In most instances, these extreme tails can be ignored. The normal distribution does go to infinity in both directions. You have two populations here. Both are normally distributed. Their shapes are the same for the females and the males, but both graphs are centered at different means. So the means are different. The mean for the males is higher than the mean for the females, but because the shapes are the same, that means the standard deviation and variance for females and males is exactly the same. So the females have a lower mean than the males. In this example, companies A and B are both centered at the same point, so they have the same population mean. But as you can see, the shape of the two distributions is different. Company B is more spread out, so the data for company B has a higher standard deviation and a higher variance than company A. The total area under each curve is 1. In reality, once you've collected your data, you put it into a grouped frequency table, and then you plot a histogram, and if it appears as though a normal distribution would be a good fit, then it's possible that the data can be modelled with a suitable normal distribution. And that normal distribution then 
then can be used to calculate probabilities. This is the standard normal distribution. It's a very special case of the normal distribution. It's the only one that you see in the formula book. <coughs> um, it has all of the probabilities tabulated in the formula book. The mean for the standard normal distribution is zero and it has a variance of one and a standard deviation of one. The graph extends to one, two and three towards the right and minus one, minus two, minus three towards the left. This is the one that you always sketch when you're solving problems to do with the normal distribution. So for instance, when you're calculating probabilities or when a probability is given and you're trying to work out a data value, this is the one that you always work with. Here's table three from the formula book. There's the curve, the distinctive curve of the normal distribution. You've got Z values there and probabilities are in the center of the table with Z values around the outside. The inverse or the reverse of this table is having probabilities on the outside and Z values on the inside. Let's have a look at table 4. As you can see here, P is on the outside and the values on the inside of the table are Z values. Both of these tables are useful depending on whether you're calculating probability, that's table 3, or if probability is given to you and you're working out a data value, then you use table 4.